Almighty God, giver of all good things, look at favor upon all of us here gathered this evening. Show us with your blessings of peace, love, and fellowship as we engage in the consultation with the people of Shogonis and Environs for the betterment of the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through constitutional reform. And at the end of these proceedings, take each of us back safely to our homes and our families. Amen. Namaste. Amen. Thank you. We invite you to sit. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reforms uh, Community Outreach and uh, Listening Session here at uh, the Southern Hall, Center Point Mall, Ramsaran Street, Chaguanas. We're delighted to be with you, and permit me, just before introducing the chairman to deliver opening remarks, members of the National Advisory Committee. We have with us the committee chair and former speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Barindra Sinanen, attorney at law and former Central Bank Deputy Governor, Dr. Terence Farrell, attorney at law and former speaker of the House, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, former independent senator, Mrs. Helen Drayton, consulting manager partner, EY, Heman Reinsing, Public Service Commission Chairman and former Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Winston Rudder. Attorney at Law and former Clerk of the House is Jacqueline Sampson Miguel. And former Tobago House of Assembly Chief Administrator, Mr. Ray Sandy. You're fortunate this evening, Shigwanas, that all members of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform are with you. And not because we're a small group means that there won't be fruitful and bountiful presentations and contributions. In fact, members of the committee are also available to engage with you based on the points or suggestions that you may have as it relates to the con Constitution, reform of the Constitution, or even your observations that may require some clarification as to whether they are applicable now and into the future. However, before your part starts, permit me to invite to address you and deliver opening remarks the Chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. Will you please welcome Mr. Barindra Sinanan? Thank you very much, Wendell. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, I am pleased to welcome you to this special meeting this afternoon. The Constitution, as you know, is the highest law of the land and the cornerstone of the nation's commitment to upholding fundamental human rights, ensuring social justice and public accountability, and creating a strong democratic framework to guide its future development in the interests of the welfare prosperity and happiness of citizens. My committee is, entrusting, is, in, sorry, is ensuring that you, the citizens, are at the forefront and center of any reform initiative, which is why we are here today. Constitutional reform is an extremely con complex and lengthy process, not just in our country, but actually worldwide. We acknowledge the numerous past attempts, which only reinforce the need for our collective, persistent and consistent civic duty for the betterment of our nation and future generations. I express my sincere gratitude for your presence here today. Your contribution is invaluable. Your voice matters, and we are here to listen. Just to give you an idea of part of our mandate, the committee will be required to initiate, consult widely and guide the national debate towards the generation of packages, generation of a package of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June 2024. So one thing is to be clear, we are not writing any constitution. We are here to listen to your 
views, your ideas, what you think about the Constitution, how can, what you want to see change in the Constitution. So we're here to listen to you. And um, I want to welcome you again. And I and my committee, we are looking forward to uh, a robust meeting and, and your valued contribution this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sinanen. Perhaps it's important to have a bit of background. Some of us may have been around for many engagements and iterations as it's related to understanding our Constitution, and perhaps you might have been here when the first Constitution um, uh, was presented to us as citizens of the country. However, now, um, where, ha where have we arrived at? How far are we along on this journey? And to give us a bit of a background of the project and perhaps understanding a little bit of what has gone before us and why what has gone before us is not lost on the committee, please welcome Dr. Terence Farrell. Thanks very much, Wendell. Uh, and <clears throat> pleasant good evening to everybody. Uh, just, just let me say, this committee is, is um, quite happy whether we have two people or 200 people, it doesn't matter. We are here uh, to engage with you, to hear your thoughts and to hear your ideas. Uh, by way of background, um, th this is the fifth time since the 1976 Constitution, that is the Constitution that we now have in Trinidad and Tobago, this is the fifth time that constitutional reform is being attempted in this country. The 1976 Constitution came out of the work of the Wooding Commission, which worked between 1972 and 1974. But many of the recommendations of the Wooding Commission were not taken on board by the Prime Minister at the time, it was Eric Williams. In fact, most of the recommendations were not taken on board. And essentially what we did in 1976 is that we became a republic, that is to say, we, the Queen was no longer head of state, there was no Governor General, we put the President of, uh, in, in place of the Governor General, we took away some powers from the Prime Minister and gave some of those powers to the President. Uh, we instituted the office of the DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions. Prior to that, the Attorney General, who was a politician, was responsible for prosecutions. And that was pretty much about what we did to create the Republic. Now, the point is that, that the Constitution that was given to us then, that made us a Republic, was not that much different from the 1962 Independence Constitution. So, in truth and in fact, what we have today, in 2024, is a constitution that was put in place in 1962. And it's important to, to remind ourselves that that 1962 constitution, independence constitution, was put in place very, very hurriedly. We had a federation between 1958 and 1961. Jamaica had a referendum, and they said, they're out. Eric Williams famously said, one from ten leaves not, and that was the end of the Federation. And both Jamaica and Trinidad moved very quickly to become independent from Britain. And so in that process, in that hasty process, the constitution which we, which we took, <clears throat> and I have to say took, was given to us by the British. We adopted a lot of the institutions, the ways of doing things and so on from the British and we put them into what was the Trinidad and Tobago Independence Constitution. And as I said, we didn't make much change to that in 1976. But the society always recognized that it wasn't working. And so the NAR, 12 years later, had the Hayatali Commission. And the Higher Tally Commission set about the process of constitutional reform. They, too, set about doing exactly what we are doing and going out to meet the public, uh, the public 
and talking about the need for reform. But the Hayatali Commission process was interrupted by the 1990 attempted coup, and nothing came of that uh, effort. The first Manning administration between 1991 and 1995 didn't do anything, but the Pandey administration, the first Pandey administration, instituted some important pieces of legislation with constitutional implications. So some of these were the Judicial Review Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and we had the Integrity in Public Life Act, which essentially revamped the Integrity Commission. And all of these things have important constitutional implications. But still, that need for reform was recognized. It was there because things were happening in the society. Things were happening in the politics. There was a lot of turbulence around. Apart from the attempted coup, we had issues with the Speaker of the House. Uh, a number of things happened. And people recognized that, look, the thing isn't working, that there were issues around the judiciary. In, 19, in 2006, a group of businessmen and some other civil society people, including the Archbishop and some other people and so on, they, this was the Principles of Fairness Committee. They said, look, let's draft a constitution. And they did that with Tajmul Hussain, who was senior counsel, and Sajmul Hussain drafted a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. The Manning administration, which was then operating, said, okay, we, we, we will we hear you. And he embarked on a process of constitutional reform going around the country in the same way. And Ellis Clark drafted a constitution for Trinidad in 2009. All of these, by the way, are on our website. So if you go to our website, you will see all of those documents from 1962, 76, High Tally Commission. Uh, you will see the Principles of Fairness draft. You will see the Ellis Clark draft. And then in 2013, the UNC administration, with the Ramada Committee, set about doing the same thing, going about exactly like what we are doing and engage in the process of constitutional reform. Now, what does that say about what's been going on? And what I think it says is that there is a need for reform. Every single administration has recognized that the constitution that we have is not working for us very well. And it is no surprise, because the constitution that we have, for all intents and purposes, is a British colonial constitution given to us rather hurriedly in 1962. So we shouldn't be surprised when the public service is not working well, when the service commissions are not working well, when the judiciary is not working well, when there are issues around the prime minister and the cabinet and so on, when there are issues around the presidency, because the institutions have not been designed well. And as we look forward, and as we look forward in respect of our children and our grandchildren who will inherit Trinidad and Tobago, who are facing issues, critical issues, around climate change, around technological advances, including artificial intelligence and so on, who are facing a world that is in turmoil, that is on the brink of war in many instances. All these things are happening, and yet we are operating with a system of governance in Trinidad and Tobago which is over 60 years old and given to us by the British. It has to change. And the process of change has to involve the people of Trinidad and Tobago stepping up and saying, this is what we want. So our process has been to take all of the previous efforts that we've had. So we've started with Wooding, the Wooding Report. And we've come forward with the Higher Talent Report, the Principles of Fairness, the Ellis Cloud Draft, the Ramada Committee Report. And we are engaged in this exercise uh, to get the views of the people. And we are going to present a set of proposals for reform which come from you and from all of the previous efforts that have been made before. And we will put that in the government and hopefully we will move to a, a, a conference, a consultation, which will enable the population to speak to those changes that we want to see. So essentially, that's the background to it, and we would love to hear your views uh, on what you think should happen. We have, by the way, received almost 900 email submissions from the public to date, between the time we started in early March and now 900 
almost 900 sub, uh, email submissions from the public in Trinidad and Tobago with their suggestions. And we'd love to hear from you this evening and to see what interesting things you have to tell us about what you'd like to see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, five-minute history lesson. And context is very important. If we don't know where we have come from, how are we really supposed to determine where we are going? And here's an interesting um, context to help you. We're going to start with our first round that will allow you in five minutes per contributor an opportunity to really share the salient points that you wish to bring forward. If you see every member of the committee writing, it's because apart from recording everything and making sure that there's an electronic uh, copy, they want to also have in their possession your feedback. Once we've made the round, you may hear some points that someone made before you, or you may want to enhance on what you have said based on something that someone said that probably sparked your imagination or, or, or suggestion. And so we may go again because we have a little bit of time, meaning that we have your availability in small numbers, but good time in which to hear perhaps once or twice. He is to keep us on time. And so by 8 p.m. we should be uh, concluding and bringing our discussion and our, our sharing to a close. From time to time, when you make a contribution, members of the committee may ask for clarification or may provide you with context in areas that you may not have been too certain about. And finally, I am putting in a one cent, not a two cent worth. What we perceive as ideas today are really intended, as you can now understand from Dr. Farrell, for how we will look after our affairs in the future. So whilst you may be a contributor in 2024, perhaps what you share today may very well be enshrined in the Constitution somewhere well into 2050. We hope so. And bear in mind, finally, we are looking after 1.4 million citizens of our country. And very few of us in this room perhaps have had the responsibility of ensuring that we serve 1.4 million people, each with their varying demands. And so the floor is open, and we invite our first contributor to make their way to the microphone that's in front. For those of you who may be at the back, I, I'll just ask that you come forward. It's only to facilitate the recordings when the time comes, and uh, we invite our first contributor to please come forward. As you make your way to the microphone, we kindly ask your name and your general district, because we like to know that for our records to assist. The floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, hi, good evening. Um, my name is Inzamam Rahman. Mr. Rahman. Uh, from the general area of Charlieville. Charlieville. Welcome. Okay. Um, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, uh, my first thoughts um, are actually surrounding our method of balloting. In particular, um, I think first past the post is not a, an ideal method of balloting, um, especially in the context of the current literature and economics and computer science, mathematics, political science, there have been a lot better methods that have been developed since way back when plurality voting would have been first conceived hundreds of years ago. Um, in particular, um, I think methods such as score, then automatic runoff, uh, three to one voting, and ranked pairs, um, also known as Tiedemann's alternative, are more mathematically robust and um, under com robust computer simulations in the social sciences has shown, um, it shows that it tends to satisfy voters more under those robust um, computer simulations. Um, with regards to the composition of the Senate, I, I, I believe that the independent senators should actually outnumber 
the number of government and opposition senators. And, um, this is, and I also believe there should be a fourth, I guess you could say, a unit of the Senate that should be formed perhaps through a citizen assembly type method, similar to what has been done in Ireland and in British Columbia, perhaps formed using some sort of almost Athenian style sortition mechanism to select general members of the public who pass with certain qualifications if they'd like to, like to serve for a period of maybe one to two years. Um, with reg regards to um, the eligibility of members of parliament, um, you know, uh, the Sam Talib, the statistician, he, he has this um, nice maxim of, you know, when you have skin in the game, as he likes to put it, you tend to get better outcomes from decision makers. And because of that, I think it might be beneficial in the constitution that we actually state that if somebody is going up as a candidate for a member of parliament in a particular constituency, that perhaps they should be resident in that constituency for at least five years prior to their candidacy, and they should remain uh, resident within that, that constituency um, during their tenure, with, of course, the prime minister being the, the, the one uh, exception to this. Um, regards to am I, am I, I still have time? Sorry. Um, regards to digital privacy, um, um, I think maybe some elements of GDPR can possibly be looked at and integrated into our constitution, especially um, given the impacts of the importance of data privacy and the potential impacts of things like AI and machine learning um, right now and the potential effects of that. Maybe a somewhat diluted form of GDPR's right to an explanation perhaps might be useful to integrate there. And I think we perhaps need something of some, some element of campaign finance reform. Within, embedded within the Constitution as well. I guess, last point, uh, I think participatory budgeting should be also looked at as a mechanism, particularly for when it comes to the, um, how the finances of local government are actually run. Um, there's a really great anthology series um, by the World Bank, a book actually detailing participatory budgeting, budgeting mechanisms by Shah, Shah Anwar that would actually give an interesting starting point to look at. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rahman. Uh, members, as you make your way forward, <coughs> sorry, just uh, be a little mindful of taking your time. We're in a room where there's a little bit of bounce with the sound, and so by the time it reaches to the committee, uh, there's a little bit of an echo, so please take your time, just slow down slightly. Um, and if there's anything in the Constitution that's working, that you really think is strength to the quality of how we should um, uh, control our affairs and manage our affairs, by all means, uh, let us know as well. And we have our next contributor. Good evening, welcome. Uh, if we could increase the volume on the floor, please. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. My name is Eric Esdell, and I'm from the village of Carpi, China. Welcome. Uh, gentlemen, I have listened to the question of constitutional reform and it has bedeviled me for quite some time now as to how we can use our constitution in order, and this is a phrase which I borrowed, to create a kinder, gentler nation. I'm of the view, gentlemen, that one of the reasons why we are in this great pickle today is because there are less elected members properly involved in the affairs of state and more individuals who elect themselves to positions that are involved in it. Our communities are dying. Where are the elected members? So I want to start with the office of President of the Republic. I am of the view that we ought to have an executive president. There are others who are of that view also. But one of the things that bedevils us with that view is how should we elect such an individual? I have heard talk of proportional representation, something to which I'm not wedded to at all. <laughs> and I have heard talk that perhaps the lower house of parliament should elect such an individual. That 
in my view, should not be your first brush. I want the view, gentlemen, that we can fashion an electoral college based on the sum total of polling divisions that exist in the country. So to just skirt it over while there are granular details to my plan, the individual who wins the most amount of polling divisions in the country wins the presidency, in my view. I'm also of the view that a president also have a running mate who is also a vice president. And even while you run for president and vice president, simultaneously, you would have the ability, if you so desire, to run for any, house, any seat in the lower house of parliament. I have a process by which an, a replacement could easily be made in that case. Now, I am also of the view that no one who holds the position of a member of parliament, a member of the lower house or upper house, should ever sit in the cabinet. The executive president should have the ability to select his cabinet from members nationwide, throughout, but certainly not one who is at, at that time sitting in the lower house. Dime of that view. We move on to the question of the member of parliament. Now, I'm of the view that a member of parliament, that's a representative from the lower house, having been so elected, ought to be there full time. Because his responsibility, in my view, should also be to ensure the geographical space over which he governs is the best that it can be. Who is going to take care of delinquent youths, of ensuring that you have appropriate institutions of learning, of developing the community, of husbanding the resources of the community for the betterment of the community? He has the moral responsibility to do that. And only if you give him full time can he do that. So I believe that we ought to have a full-time member of parliament. Now, in relation to the question of the cabinet, like I said before, the cabinet ought to be selected from members who the president so choose for the different skill set. But at the end of the day, they would, of course, have to be, in some way or the other, vetted by the lower house, in my view. Now, we come to the question of the upper house of parliament. In the upper house of parliament, what I am suggesting is that we look at the area where we now have the nine offices which we call independent, which is not really and truly independent, and I would like to change that in a way. I believe we ought to say we're going to give one, one seat to the law association, one to the interreligious organization, one to a society of academics, and one to the chamber of commerce. The other five seats, however, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, um, I believe that the parties which contested presidential election and did not gain a seat in the lower house, we can find a way to share the remaining five seats among them, but not giving any one party more than one seat. So that way, what we'd be trying to do is to bring all of the different views that we have politically in the country under the umbrella of the parliament, where they can continually give their views and expose their views to the population. One of the other things I want to suggest is this, that um, when it comes to the question of the election of a president, as I propose, I propose that we try to ensure that anyone who chooses to run for president is not barred by some circumstance so that we would have what I would like to call a write-in candidate. If it is that you cannot pay the fee by the EBC, if it is that your party didn't get enough amount of votes to be placed on the ballot, we have a write-in slot because democracy is about husbanding the views of all of us. And lastly, Chairman, I want to say this. Nothing that I have suggested here this evening can work, save and except we look at the question of salaries. I believe to myself, Chairman, that I would like to base the salary of what I propose to be 
a full-time member of parliament, pay him as a CEO. In today's world, I would pay him $60,000 a month. And I would like to send, use that as a basis to give the president $120,000 a month. I will give a member of the upper house of parliament um, $30,000 a month. And I would give the speaker of the house and of course the vice president $80,000 a month. So at the end of the day, I believe to myself that we ought to recognize that whenever it is persons are elected to positions in the country and you give them a job to do, we don't want you doing any other job but the one we elect you to do. So we give you a proper remunerative package. There can be no complaint and you can do your job. And if we really want to do something proper in this country, Chairman, there's nothing more important than having a member of parliament who is full-time. So we're going to have less community leaders in our country. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rasmussen. Good evening and welcome. Just to give you some context, we are facilitating the contributions from the floor. Uh, and you have a time limit in your first contribution of five minutes. It's really just to ensure that we get the views of all accommodated within the time frame that we have. We do have a time slot up to 8 p.m. So as you feel comfortable, by all means, make your way to the microphone at the front and you can make your contribution. Uh, I will guide if we are going a little too over time to help you to crystallize your point and finalize. And we have our third contributor at the microphone, so good evening and welcome. Good evening to all, thank you. I would like to submit... Help us with your name and your location, okay, please. Okay, sorry. My name is Tixian Toby. Ms. Toby, yes. And I live in Chagonas. Chagonas, welcome. Proper Chagonas. Okay, thanks. We are in a global information society and we have had data breaches, hacking, cyber crimes. We have AI technology. Part one of our constitution refers to the right of the individual to life, liberty, etc. In part one, it should be inserted in section A. This is um, a suggestion. The right of the individual to life, liberty, security of the person, cyber security, data security, and enjoyment of property, real and intellectual property and the right not to be deprived thereof except by the process of law. So my suggestion is cyber security should be included, data protection should be included in light of the various data breaches and hacking that we as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have experienced in the past months and previous years. Yes, we have a Data Protection Act. Yes, we have a Freedom of Information Act. Yes, we have a Computer Misuse Act. But our Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago should be reformed to include the technological advancements that are taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. The name of our nation is Trinidad and Tobago. That's the name of our nation. But Tobago has two seats, Tobago East and Tobago West. Trinidad has 39 seats. Therefore, if we look at Section two, it states, well, sorry, section three, the number of constituencies in Tobago shall not be less than two. 
Now, if section 4 is correct based on the mathematics and statistics, then the Constitution is right based on the number of individuals in the constituency. And if that is the case, then we need to change section 4 under the second schedule, section 17, under section 72. Okay? So basically, what I'm saying is the number of constituencies in Tobago should increase from two at least to four. Because if the name of Trinidad and Tobago is Trinidad and Tobago, then the number of constituencies in Tobago should not just be two. Because it's not fairly proportional. So therefore, it should increase to at least four. That's another point. Okay. In the American system, when we look at electing, we have where the president serves two terms. In Trinidad and Tobago, we should have a system where the prime minister, the president, opposition leader, leader of a political party, should be limited to two terms in office. And he or she, not more than three years in office or 10 years in office. I'm, not, I'm saying, okay, take a break. Come back. So let's say you serve two terms, five to 10 years. I'm not. I'm, I mean, I respect all the officers, respect, but take a break. So two consecutive terms, give somebody else a chance, come back after five years. So that way we have new leadership and the opportunity for others to come forward and serve and when an individual takes a break, physically, it's good for everyone, and mentally as well. And therefore, you could, I'm not saying you take a total break, you could still be an advisor. Sit on your side, advise, consult, because you do have a lot of skills and advice that would be useful to the running of Trinidad and Tobago. Take a break, but not three consecutive. So that way we can avoid a number of situations. I'm not criticizing any um, office, but two consecutive terms. Come back after five years, I move on. I agree. In terms of senators, oh, okay, okay. In terms of senators, increase the number of senators. So, under the prime minister's office or his responsibility of appointments, 18. Under the opposition, nine or 10. And under the senator, or oh, sorry, the president, 10. So we could have at least 35 or 37 instead of 31. Therefore, we will have further development in Trinidad and Tobago because we are putting Trinidad and Tobago first. Thank you. Ben is here, by all means. Is it just a question or are you ready to make your contribution? By all means, come right ahead. Welcome. And immediately after, the gentleman who is on your left, so you will be able to follow him. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Hello, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, good evening to all the uh, committee members and um, uh, citizens here. 
My name is Kevin Shepard, and I am from the Shaguanas area. Sure. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> My contributions this evening will center around our voting process and the structure of how we elect our um, officials. So, my first point of three is to separate the role of member of parliament and minister. Um, when MPs serve as ministers, and I believe other people have touched on this before, their role as parliamentary representative usually trumps, uh, <clears throat> well, for the people, sorry, uh, usually suffers in favor of their ministerial portfolio. Uh, make it so that MPs cannot serve the two roles as both roles are very demanding and um, I believe that proper attention needs to be given to each, to the functions of each role by discrete individuals. To add to that second point, to add to that first point, sorry, I think that we should restructure our local government elections to be uh, local in every sense of the word. By that I mean we can allow MPs to be elected as part of that local government process. On the ballot can be a section for selecting a member of uh, parliament for the constituency and another section for selecting a, for selecting a councillor for the area. In that way we get representation both on the um, regional cooperation level and have a voice and the people will have a voice in the parliament. And this kind of ties in the sec to my third and final point which is where we move to having persons vote for either an executive president or a prime, a prime minister directly. And I say that because this will allow voters to vote for the candidate specifically that they want and not have that candidate win through the votes of their MPs. A typical scenario is what happens is I might like my MP, but I may not like the leader of the party that, uh, that they represent, and that person is the one who usually um, takes, office, takes the office of prime minister. The situation could, always be in the reverse, could also be in the reverse, where I only vote for <clears throat> my desired prime minister or president uh, using my MP as a proxy. And this, you know, in this, in this uh, structure, this means that the vote for the MP is more like a means to an end as opposed to an actual endorsement. So, and of course, uh, tying into what uh, the lady before me uh, said, limiting the amount of terms a person can uh, hold a persistent political office. Two terms, four years each, or something there about. Uh, I believe that these changes will allow us to have, uh, will allow people to actually select the people that they want to lead them for a particular period, as well as facilitate more dynamic and um, you know, dynamic changes and prevent stagnation in the country's directorate. And uh, these are all my contributions, so thank you. Sorry. My name is Iqbal Heidel. I'm from Felicity, Shagonas. Sorry, just one more time, your name? Iqbal Heidel. Heidel, thank you. Heidel. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm indeed grateful that the Prime Minister has established this Constitutional Reform Committee so that my voice can finally be heard. I've often wondered what my elected representatives represent. We see them knocking at our doors at election times after which they seem to be not out of action from their constituents. To make room for photo shots, cutting ribbons to open a slice of road, some new business establishment, or to show off their new hairstyle at some sporting event or cultural shoot. It is in this context that I humbly wish to make the following submissions to the Constitutional Reform Committee. One, it must be mandatory that an elected member to parliament hold a well-advertised public consultation every six months with their constituents who can question its representative of the work done in the constituency and reveal projected plans for the next six months at their constituency offices, which are underused 
at taxpayers' expense. In my own case, as a marriage officer, after struggling to get an appointment to see my member of parliament on discrepancies that exist in filling out a marriage, the marriage certificate, I have had no positive action. Secondly, it must be mandatory that an elected member to an elected district councillor hold public consultation every three months with their constituents who can question its representative of the work done in the constituency in the electoral district and reveal projected plans for the next three months. And they can have this at their constituency offices, which are underused and paid by the taxpayers. A case in point, despite trying to see my counselor, followed by a letter to the corporation more than four years ago, and several pictures on Facebook, I have been unable to get my counselor to fix open manholes directly in front of my home, in which two cars have already gone down, and a number of persons, including myself, suffered from foot injuries. Thirdly, Failure to conduct two consecutive consultations. The elected member's position should be revoked. I don't know by what means, by the president or by some other means that the constitutional reform can put in place so that they, they can be revoked because they have not been doing their job. I thank you. Thank you very much. At microphone, and so you will be after immediately after, and so you will follow the gentleman who is immediately behind you. So we're going good on time, so let's just keep it going. Yes, good night everyone. Right, right lovely. Good night everyone. Um, so, forgive my attire, I had to run away from my football session to be able to come to give a contribution on behalf of the Edinburgh 500 community. My name is Kern Cupid. I am the former youth officer of the community of Edinburg 500 and Londonville South. So we are in a position where we have an expanding community, right? Beautiful community in the center of Shogonas, where we believe that support is needed with regards to provide opportunities for our community's youth who are in a place of despair with regards to Opportunities won, or if we should take up said opportunities. Why I said the last part is that the access to these opportunities for me is not readily given. Um, I believe that an opportunity for employment um, can be a, a big solution to that with regards to a food village in our community, right, which has been on the back burner for decades. Right? For those who are familiar with the Edinburgh 500 community, there is a big savanna, and the big savanna is underutilized, in my opinion, right? It has the foundation to become a multi-purpose facility because we have netball, where the girls are active, because we don't take the females seriously enough, in my opinion. So the girls are active with the netball, but resources and also a proper facility is needed. Um, toilet facilities has left a lot to be desired with regards to the maintenance and the regular upkeep of the community. Football, basketball, cricket. Um, we have a nice cricket facility, but the maintenance of the ground is, again, um, left on the back burner. As well as we have a nice foundation with regards to making a popular multi-purpose facility at the community. So I hope that um, my short contribution I hope that it falls in the right circles with regards to getting um, more involvement, right? I'm sorry that I cannot be too long because I have to run away as well to another engagement football-wise. So thank you again for your time. I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Mr. Thanks. Cupid, before you leave, thank you first. Thank you for your contribution, and I'm mindful that you're on a time constraint. Were we to put this in the context of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. Right. I'm going to help you a little bit so you no can problem. tell me if I'm on the right spot. Would you say that all constituencies mm -hmm. should ensure that facilities that are in the communities or constituencies should be structured in such a way
to be a benefit of to the majority or all, you can categorize it, young persons or all in their constituencies? Um, I will just piggyback on what you said. Okay. Um, with regards to what was just said, I hope that the Constitution and constitutional reform would be able to assist in having proper facilities for both young and old right. as well too because we minus the elderly feeling that they're not important but they are important as well too so yes okay and secondly mm -hmm. and having such facilities in all of our constituencies for the young and for the seniors the elderly that there is a structure for maintenance of these facilities for their ongoing service to their constituents correct and finally that wherever possible, multi-purpose facilities are mm -hmm. also part of constituencies for community engagement. Yes. That would help? Yes, that would definitely help. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, thank you very much. You're very Everyone welcome, and thank you for making the time and for your service to the young people in, in Edinburgh. Uh, sorry, microphone for the panel, please. If I may ask uh, Mr. Cupid. Mr. Cupid, you mind coming back to the microphone, please? <laughs> Sorry, that's what might happen. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Cupid, I heard you talk about, are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that you are involved in, in, in the youth movement. Yes, I am the former youth officer for the Edinburgh 500 Community Council. Yes. And um, why, why I asked you to come back, I just wanted to find out from you whether you are still actively involved. Because, you know, I heard, um, I don't know if you were here, when Mr. Esdell made a comment. He said, our communities are dying. And, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the Constitution of the United States of America, it starts like this. We, the people, when you compare that to the beginning or the preamble to our constitution, it says, whereas the people. Mm -hmm. My interpretation of that is as if we, are be we, the people, are being referred to in the third person, as if, according to Dr. Farrell, we were handed down a constitution from 1962 mm -hmm. that we are still grappling with. What I um, want to indicate to you is that we are working, we are not rewriting, but we are working towards um, a revised constitution one way or another, and we are preparing the background work for that exercise as explained by our chairman. I'm saying that because a number of people came in just after our chairman spoke. What we are having is a special youth forum. And Ms. Samson, Ms. Samson could tell us about that. And we are encouraging and we are asking for help. We, the committee, we are asking for help. Because if we, the people, are the ones to pro help to produce a constitution, it means that we, the people, have to get together and prevent our communities from dying. Ms. Samson, you want to tell us when? <laughs> yes, it's Trinidad. I think uh, Mr. Reinsing has passed you the dates. Right. The 4th of May for the Trinidad Youth Council South and the 11th of May mm -hmm. for the Trinidad Youth Council North. That is next month. Yes, it is. So we hope to see you there. Yes, I'll make my very best efforts to be And we, want, we would wish that you, you invite people to come. It's a public thing. Yes, no problem. And we are asking as many people to come as possible. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much for coming and taking your time yeah, off. Yes, you no were problem. running away. Any other questions? Uh, thanks again. <laughs> Mr. Cupid, you are now clear to return to just, the field. Just the first, the first youth meeting, Mr. Mr. Cupid? Mr. Cupid, the just first the chair, one is the at the San Fernando City Corporation Hall. Yes, I got the answer. Oh, you got the answer. Yes, I got the answer.
Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you, sir. All right, we invite our gentleman that was identified. Yes, please come forward. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening to the head table. The Mr. Motley. Not Motley, Wendell Constantine. Constantine. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm seeing some very, very notable Trinidad thinkers. And I probably should start uh, that way or at that level. My name is Michael Tusser, Dr. Michael Tusser, University of the West Indies. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Good afternoon, good evening. All respects to the head table. I said I'm seeing some notables, people of distinguished contribution to Trinidad and Tobago at this table. And I am very, very surprised that I look around, I'm a lecturer at the University of the West Indies, and I don't see any students here. I don't see people who are particularly young and who's, who are the beneficiaries of whatever we achieve in this country and the sufferers ultimately when we don't achieve what we think we should achieve or what we should achieve and we never got there, we never got off the, the starting line. I am happy that at this particular juncture, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has begun this constitutional reform exercise. My congratulations and I thank you all for making yourselves present and so on. But you know, sometimes we have to be honest, very honest, very blatant. This, what you are doing is for the future generation. They are not here. And this is as distant as it can get when we're talking about the most serious and critically important matter in the development of any country, whether it is Trinidad and Tobago, whether it is the United States, whether it is Australia, India, whatever. This is the most critical exercise because the Constitution has to do with the rules that govern the operation of the country, that govern the lives and the outcomes of everything we do. And I'm making this point because I don't think we are well informed or approaching it this way. You may like what I'm saying, you may not like it. I am telling you what I think because I was invited to tell you what I think. Years ago, there used to be a book called Thinking Things Through. And every child in this country, Trinidad and Tobago, our republic, had to study that book because it had factors, elements related only to the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. I don't see a university person here from UE. I don't see one from UTT. I don't see one from the Southern Caribbean, University of the Southern Caribbean. I don't see anybody from Costat. So this is the same story with the same group. Not you in particular. I'm drawing a wider reference. This is not a national discourse. This is a travesty. Seriously. This is the most important thing. So we hear all kinds of things. And we're going to make decisions and so on. But are the people really involved? No. And if you tell me yes, I will understand. Because we think that we involve the people. But we sometimes we simply don't. They are not involved. And so what I would ask this group to do, do the best that you can to get the people involved. Get the youth of the country involved in this discussion. Because a constitution is not something that you play with. Our constitution has pedigree, if you understand what I'm saying. We have a constitution that we inherited in the Commonwealth mode. Prime ministerial system of government, republican system of government, change from prime ministerial, and so on, and so on, and so on. And sometimes when we try to reinvent the wheel, we end up in trouble. A constitution, we are 50 years old, yes. But a constitution is not something you get up one morning and say, change that. Have an executive president. Because you could end up with one of the executives of the kind that you have in some places whose names I will not mention. A constitution is not a simple document 
that you can grasp when you come from a short notice and you say, there's this wonderful meeting on constitutional reform. No, no, no. Our constitution is more than that. I know everyone means well, but meaning well and doing well are two different things. Okay? Our constitution comes from a framework. It's a hybrid between the American constitution and the, uh, the, the, the preamble that you're talking about comes from the American package and the British constitution, which really don't exist. Right? But we have models that we follow. I am not sure that people in Trinidad and Tobago, I'm sorry to say this, take constitutional discussions seriously. I remember there was a time, and I remember getting a copy of a book from this wonderful citizen of Trinidad and Tobago on the laws of the British Parliament and so on and so on during a time when our constitution was in crisis in terms of discussing something called Section 24. And when the matter came up, not one of the politicians in Trinidad and Tobago referred to any reference book. Which guided you on what is necessary. Okay? So I started with that, and I don't want to be overbearing and too long. But I really think we should take the opportunity to extend this into a national discussion. This is the kind of thing that in countries, people have referendum on. Here we are sitting here in our cloistered environment, making suggestions and so on. But this is our constitution. And we cannot politicize it by how well we do it, or how well we didn't do it, or how well it was not done. This is a serious discourse. Involve, extend invitations to the, I'm not seeing one student of the law school here. Constitution is law. Am I making sense? Constitution is law. Students are studying law. Where are they? And of course, you see the wonderful large audience that we have. Follow what I'm saying? So let's get serious. We have the opportunity to turn this into something that has the rigor that is necessary for constitutional reform. Because it is often said that constitutions are tools of the ruling class. <laughs> you laugh. You know what I'm talking about. And we could be rehashing. Our constitution has a lot to offer. And there are changes and there are regular amendments to the constitution. But I want to inform you as someone who has been involved in education for maybe 40 something years. People in Trinidad and Tobago don't know anything about the Constitution. They know about politicizing stuff. And if we are serious and we are not into window dressing, smoke screens and mirror, we will do this thing right. The second thing that I want to talk about that will give you an example. Our system is primarily British. Hmm? To take a classical example. Trinidad is the headquarters of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And I'm showing you how wonderful we are at this thing. And not a case involved in Trinidad reaches the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is in Trinidad and Tobago. So much for our appreciation of constitutionality. So much for our growth and development in respect of constitutionality. And so much for what we are doing. That is just an example of how serious we take constitutional reform. Okay? We have suggestions to change the constitution to two terms. People make a mistake when they're thinking about America. Trinidad is not that large. If you look at something called America's Got Talent, you see how much talent they have. We have talent too, but we're limited in population. How, how large are we? And then there's something called developmental plans. People have to have the ability to develop the plans. You know, it was developmental plans that made Russia strong during World War I, that they could come back and be a threat to the world because you have plans and then you have time to develop it. And we can't just go just like that and say, we're going to change the, the amount of time. What's the rationale for the figure anyhow? It makes sense. Limited amount of terms, but are we right in the, in the, in the duration of the service of particular politicians? The next thing, that I'm saying, and this is the final point because I need to get out of here so I wouldn't be shot. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay? We need to deal with the question 
of recall. In Trinidad and Tobago, politicians get away with anything. Anything. In fact, reaching that elevated stage of success, right, means that you can do anything, say anything, not do anything, not say anything. They don't have to function. And you have that quite a lot in Trinidad and Tobago. There must be some system of calling back people who are not serving the interests of the country without politicizing it. And then finally, we do not have a system of local government in Trinidad. Our society was not developed that way. It developed among plantations, and the thing was the British government and what they did, and we have a, 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 a copy of the British system at the political level. Local government never meant anything. That's why if you travel around a street called Perseverance Street in Chagonas, and I hope the mayor was here, and I would think that such a discussion to, to say what I'm saying, or to emphasize what I'm saying, that the mayor would have been here. They have refused to clean the drains for the past 10 years. That's local government. That is community development. It's an ISO. It smells bad. And you have 14 and 15 ministries getting together to improve the area, to improve an area with tourism, with two streets. Something has to be wrong with our cerebral orientation. I know you are distinguished, and I think you are serious. Let's have serious discussion. Local government reform is a must. It must change. There must be recall. Parliamentary representation is a must. There must it must change. There must be recall. Cabinet functionality is a must, and it must be recalled. People hide behind parties because party politics mean that if a minister is playing the fool, so what? People hide behind parties because party politics means that if a parliamentary representative is out of line playing the fool, let it pass. Let it pass. And what you have is more politicizing than development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michael. Uh, permit me to assist because your contribution is both passionate and timely as uh, we've had this engagement. There was a discussion that the committee would have had with the National Youth Council. And arising out of that, the structure of engagement and I'll simply say for the younger generation, is going to differ slightly from this uh, 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 scenario of community and, and uh, counties and constituency engagement, if only because we listened to their voice. Arriving at the 4th of May and the 11th of May in a larger venue, specifically to be able to facilitate that larger cross-section of young persons, including those from the universities as well also, for the purpose of being able to have the youth input into these same engagement sessions. So your point is valid because there is absolutely nothing preventing any of us who may be the parents of children of contributing age any child that sits in a car or travels with you on a daily basis and asks you, why is that street called that name? Why do we have this or why do we have that? Is wise enough to be engaging and absorbing, to be able to participate in a conversation about the rights of our people, the way we govern ourselves, and what should their future look like? So there's absolutely nothing wrong with a parent bringing their child to a constitution meeting such as this. Moreover, perhaps because of their own commitments, their own schedules, perhaps a time and place for everything, 6 p.m. might not have been conducive for parents to bring their children here. That's a and just to assure you, this committee has allocated a sense and a time for the youth, a sense and a time for the academia, a sense and a time for 
those in constituencies with the very pains that some are experiencing here, and then there are other sessions before a conference is available and planned for June of 2024 that for our indication is called a national consultation conference on constitution reform. So you are right. And I think some of the points that you are making, there are efforts and steps already underway to implement them. Allow us to prove to you that we have heard and are delivering on what your suggestions and contributions have been. Okay, so there's a suggestion that, we, that we're allowing the time. I know you went over, but please, if you could just very succinctly make your point um, and yes, come back. Yes, it's very succinct. Thank you. Then widen the discourse. It is, okay. Have some quiz. Go to the Ministry of Education. Tell them, have some quiz on television about constitutionality. Valid. Set the schools up so that students can argue. They can answer questions. They can rationalize the issues before them. Yes. And do it in other spheres that re requires the same kind of focus, commitment, and tenacity. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Well done. Uh, so you were next on our, on our timeline, so please, the microphone is yours. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, guys. Uh, I don't know if you all can a hear little, me. A little bit louder, louder for us, there. please. Good evening. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Right. So good afternoon or good evening. My name is Rondell Bastia. I am from the constituency of Shagona's West. Um, I braved quite a bit of traffic just to get here, right? After nine years, we have no change in that aspect. How shameful. Um, again, good evening to the head table. Um, so I have a few points that I'll run through here very quick. I want to reiterate, first of all, I strongly demand that we must have the right to recall within our constitution. At, at right now, at present, at in our arrangement, we have 41 members who are elected by the people who basically have no say in, in, in what goes on in the country. We have a high official right now. If the media asks a question in terms of accountability, he simply says, I'm not answering that question, and walks away or just ignores. We cannot continue with that in, in, in this state. Our economy is falling apart. We demand accountability. We demand answers from our officials. We're not asking, we're demanding. Um, secondly, I am strong, a strong advocate for term limits, as was mentioned before other persons mentioned it. And we should have it, because we cannot have elected officials boasting that I am the longest serving member, and yet you have nothing to show for it after decades. Nothing, right? We want to term limits for MPs, for councillors, for anybody who's elected by the people or put in a position where they are paid by the taxpayers. We want term limits. I definitely and strongly ask that we must have referendum. Too many issues happen in our country and the citizens have no say. We want, we, we, we ask strongly for a for referendum. One of the things that ties strongly with this is the issue of accountability. In the current setup, we have nobody in, in, in our situation is accountable. Whether a councillor, a mayor, a minister, ministers serving as, well, ministers are some are MPs. So when you go to your MP and you ask for something or you make a suggestion, they say, flat, um, I tied up with my ministerial duties. I can't see about that right now. You go to the, the MP's office, the MP never there. So what you, what, what you went up for election for? Right? What was the point? To just draw a salary? We cannot have that. Right? Um, recently, there's been a discourse in the, in the public about um, removing the Privy Council um, as the final court of appeal and bringing the CCG. I sort of halfway on that, but one of our biggest problems is if we bring the CCJ on stream, what are the checks and balances? to prevent interference. We've seen a, a high, high official stop a merit list with no, with no, 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 you know, not, no recourse or nothing. Well, I just do it and the whole citizenry had to take that. How do we prevent 
interference in the CCJ. Can somebody just call up somebody in the CCJ one evening and say, make sure that case go in my favor, you know, I have a lot to lose. What does prevent that? If we go to the CCJ, we must be mature enough to have a direct gulf between the legislative, executive, everything that prevents interference in, in the CCJ. Because the region is too small, right? We're like a little block in our neighborhood. All the, all the countries of the Caribbean. We must, must have some sort of, something that prevents that. Um, right now, our, our current system is first past the post system. In 2007, we had a, a situation where 147,000 people voted for a, a political party, yet the party got no seats. So 147,000 votes went to waste, basically. Those people had no voice. We have to move away from, from first past the post system. I am suggesting proportional representation that gives more people in the country a voice, right? More, more ways to decide what goes on in country. Um, right, so we talk about that. Um, one thing we, we, we need to do is find some way within the Constitution that guarantees more accountability in terms of the judiciary, right? I know we have the GLSC, but I don't know whether that functions properly or not. We don't hear anything, we don't see anything. We spent 15 million on a DPP office, which was on one side, but what went on? Who was accounting for that money that we spent? That was taxpayer money. What went on with that money? Nobody wants to answer any questions. So yet again, we lost money as a country, right? And nothing happens. Yet again, we just spinning top in mud. Um, one thing I want written in the Constitution is how do we, how do we treat with budgets of, of different arms? Like, for example, the, the local government. Do we, do we give them a, a, a set percentage of the budget, uh, whether it's small, whether do we, we could collect taxes from the budgets? Because too often you go to your council and council and say, well, the government, they release no funds yet, you know. Hard luck, right? So, and in the meantime, mosquito bites in your whole night. Right? I know this is going to cause some controversy, but I am a citizen and I'm asking for some way for the right in the Constitution to the right to bear arms. I am definitely and strongly asking for that. Currently, we the citizens have no recourse, no protection. We've been told that, that well, just call the police. If the police feel to come, some months ago by me, a vehicle park up in front of my gate for the whole night. I seen this car idling. I called the police. The police never came. I had to go outside, right? I go by the car, by from the gate and call, try to knock on the person's glass. It's because the man got a flat, I couldn't see it because he next side of the car. And he, he pulled over and he slipped away in the car. Yes, right? So, and finally, my simple question to the entire panel is what degree or what level the, the, the suggestions being, being put forward here, is it going to be taken on board or do we end up in another case of talk shop number 54, right? We need to see some sort of action. If you're asking us to come out and make suggestions, we want to see something put in stone. The Constitution is the only document we have that guides us and protects us. And it's up to you all now to put that in place and to fix what, we were, what has gone wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rondell. Yes, our next contributor, you can please come forward. The microphones are available by all. As you arrive, just to advise us of your name and where you're generally from. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Farrell and the head table and all, all present here. My name is Marilyn Critchlow. I am from Shabonas. Welcome. Go ahead. I just wanted to... I wanted to focus a little more on leadership and governance within the Constitution. Um, but before I even go on, I want to say that I agreed with so many things that were said by Dr. Michael and also the last speaker. Um, and even Dr. Michael made some points that I wanted to make, which had to do, and what I want to say before is that we do not have a culture of stake 
stakeholder engagement. We talk about it, but what we do is we make decisions and we tell people about it and expect to get some feedback. That is not stakeholder engagement. And stakeholder engagement must be from the beginning, from the planning to the implementation stage. And effective development planning is based on stakeholder involvement. And that is why we do not have a lot of our development planning being, should I say, implemented. Because it's only the people who have done the plans know about them. The others may know, but nobody has ownership of the plans. So they're not interested in taking action. So it's not just because we have a poor, um, should I say, set of persons represented here today that is only because it is this. It is also because that is our culture. You do it for many other areas and that is exactly what happens and, we, and it's a farce that we get up and we say, oh, we have, we have the inputs of the public. We don't. And part of the also poor thing is that we do not educate the people. How many people really know about what is involved in the Constitution? You know, so you get some people would want to come to give some inputs, but in reality, they don't really have a clue as to what it is about. And it happens in all the sectors. We have many ministries with hundreds of documents, good documents, but they stay on the shelves. <laughs> you know, um, so, so that is it. So, but I wanted to focus on governance for a bit because I always say that an organization takes on the, the culture of its leader. You know, the leader actually gives the spirit to the organization. And therefore, we must be very careful that if we do in our constitution that we want to be effective to look after the people, to look after our young people, to look after our future generation. We must, we must address leadership and, govern and governance. So um, a couple of things I wanted to say with respect to we must have accountability, accom accountability mechanisms. Introduce constitutional provisions, establish independent oversight bodies tasked with monitoring government performance, investigating corruption allegations, and ensuring adherence to ethical standards. These bodies should have the authority to hold public officials accountable through transparent investigations and disciplinary actions. Another thing is merit-based appointments. Amend the Constitution to mandate merit-based selection criteria for appointments to government organizations, ministries, and boards. This could involve in establishing independent selection committees composed of experts in relevant fields to evaluate candidates based on their qualifications, experience, and demonstrated competence. And this is something I want to see. We don't have a, a culture of excellence. We have reached the point where mediocrity is our milestone. That should never be. We can never become, our objective should be to be better than even first world because the first world countries are really not great examples. And how could we be that if we don't have an objective of excellence? We, we put people because they're politically affiliated or they're friends and family. We do not have a simple thing, you have an area. We'll make a listing, a database of the experts in the area. That is not wanted. Because if that happens, the political appointees, the friends and the family will not be there. You know, and then we wonder why organizations are not performing. I mean, it is clear, very, very clear. You know, um, so, so, so those are some of the things. And as a matter of fact, what I've been in a major organization at a high level and you realize that people who really have independent 
or creative or innovative ideas are not welcomed. You must toe the line. And towing the line means that you must, be, you must not be too bright. You must not be too bright. Or you, you're too bright, you know, they wouldn't want you there. Or you're too honest. How, what are we really showing to our young people and then wanting the best from them? Think about it, you know? And again, we talk about one of the basic principles, I guess this is bringing something. We must love our neighbors as ourselves. Now tell me, you think that that happens at all? It doesn't because the politicians, before elections, they come to you. Oh, this, yes, we want to meet you. After that, as somebody alluded to, you can't meet them. They're not interested in you. They're interested in I, me, and myself. And that's why nothing happens, you know. So, I mean, then we have development, professional development and training. So, so no, I, before I even go on to that, you have boards and you put a board in place. There's nobody on the board that has the skill of the organization that they are the, the leaders of that organization. I mean, that is craziness. So you just have to depend on the person who is in charge of the organization to give you information. So if that person doesn't want to mis mislead you, you don't have a clue. You do not have the knowledge base to ask the proper questions, to get the right answers, to give the right decisions. Without data and information, you cannot make proper decisions. That is like putting a plaster on a saw and you don't know what is the cause of the saw. So if we don't address that, we could put on whatever we want that might look very nice on paper, but we still would not have addressed the problems. So another thing, we have professional development and training. Include provisions in the Constitution to prioritize ongoing professional development and training for public officials and board members. This would ensure that individuals in leadership positions have the necessary skills and expertise to effectively fulfill their roles. The other aspect is performance evaluation. Implement con constitutional provisions requiring regular performance evaluations for government organizations, ministries, and boards. You know, apart from that, another thing we have to be careful of. Some people, and I'm not getting at any some people who have been elected to positions as, or have ministerial positions, all of a sudden become a font of knowledge in an area that they know nothing about. They are even willing to, to make decisions that go against the grain of effective technical advice. And then we wonder why things go wrong. Just let me know. Our timing. All right. yeah. Okay. I just want to talk. Okay. So then, evaluation performance, and of course, as I said before, we must have citizen engagement. We have to make that part of our culture. We must, and um, then, and ethical standards and codes of conduct. Right. Strengthen constitutional provisions relating to ethical standards and codes of conduct for public officials, including provisions for conflicts of interest disclosure, restrictions on post-employment activities, and sanctions for violations of ethical norms. Okay, so I guess my time is up. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share some ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Critchlow. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman at the... And welcome. Good evening. Good evening to the panel. My name is Trevor Bridgelal Singh. I live in Shagunas. <clears throat> I am concerned about accountability. Being a member of a number of organizations and a leader of some of the organizations, one of the things I learned is if you want to kill off a good idea, form a committee, and things get you know, churned around somewhere and it's somebody else's fault. I am particularly concerned, though, about the councils and the borough councils. How do they account for what they do? 
If the Shigonas Borough Council wants to build a road, and they build the road, and then realize one month afterwards, only one car could pass at a time, so they build it over. And they build it over with a, a unique 90 degree corner, and then in two months' time, potholes appear. Whose money? Who accounts? If the Shigonas Borough Council wants to put up a building for the use of the Burgesses, but they keep the keys for 10 years. And if I go and ask them under the Freedom of Information Act, how much did you pay for that building? Who was the contractor? What was the cost? And they tell me, there's no such building. Who accounts? The UK does not have a constitution, but their councils have to account to the people. They have to produce their budgets. They have to consult with plans. And we must put in place somewhere that the, the councils, the borough councils, the county councils, whatever they are, have to be consulting with people and what they would plan to do with our money, with our funds. Because it affects me every day. The drain the gentleman talked about in perseverance, it affects me every day. Why wasn't it done? But why was a drain somewhere else done with 20 people working and two backhoes and two trucks in two days' time? Why? Right? Why in, in my neighborhood, even though I objected and had a petition, seven bars are set up in a half mile of street with pensions living over the road? And we objected, but nothing happens. So we have to have a way that these people who we elected and who are using government funds have to account to us. You want to do something like that? You have to have a meeting, you have to have a consultation. Yeah? You want to spend money? You have to have a meeting, you have to have a consultation. We want to see a budget. We don't want to hear the government that give us money. Right? So we the back hold down, we have diesel. Where the money went to, we want to know. We want to know because it affects my life every day. Thank you, good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Bridgewell Singh. Members, we are close to our time, but the microphone is still available and we're doing quite well with your contributions. Who's next? Yes, welcome. Yes, hi, good night. Good night. I'm Alex Upnarain from Shogonas. Welcome. Uh, I would like to say this is the second time I'm coming to one of these things. This constitutional reform, last time in 2018, was here. Give my contribution, and nothing happened. This would probably be the last time I'm coming here to any one of these things, because it's really hard. I gave up. I'm one of the few people who gave up money to come to this meeting. So it's not very easy, and it's been very frustrating. Seeing years after years, nobody seemed to be seeing an obvious problem. So I, I gave these things already to the NP. I literally gave them a warning in 2019, March, an email. I couldn't print it out because I didn't have time. This whole week I had to be working. I would have loved to print it out and show you. Warning of how the COVID would have affected us and nobody was prepared for that. But I'll get to my reading of the Constitution. First and foremost, I would like to say we are one people, one nation. The, from young, I've always been irritated by the distinction of, well, this is Trinidad, this is Tobago, and we always have to write out Trinidad and Tobago. Nobody will write every single islands of the Philippines. We should be recognized as the Trinbegonian people. Full stop. The, I have looked at, I have worked many places, and the way how our government run is one of the most inefficient way. It couldn't be any more inefficient if somebody tried. Everyone could always palm off blame to another person, another department. No, well, we, we wait in for the ministry, you know. No, you had to go to the corporation for that. It's too many people on the government payroll. 
in high position that are just untouchable. And that is my problem there. So first and foremost, we need to have a strong, unified country. And that starts with Tobago. Everybody talk about we need to have Tobago, we need to get more seats. No. The whole system, we need to get off of this imperial system where one man above all, where he would, the only person above all should be God. And after that, everyone should be united under his mission. My problem is that we place the prime minister, president, we always have this one monarchy always on top of us. So my, my first preference is that we have a straight referendum for the people of Tobago. Although I may not be Tobagonian, I am completely see that there's too many government inefficiencies. We have councillors, all these people. All of this needs to be done away with. The people need to know their MP, and the MP must be able to point out that I know Mr. John, I know Mr. XYZ. So we should have a national referendum for the people of Tobago. Let the people of Tobago choose whether they want to be one Trinbegonian people or if they want to be their own independent country. The Tobago House of Assembly has served a great purpose throughout the years. But just because something is working all the time doesn't mean we have to constantly be paying, paying. It has too many government businesses. When was the last time anybody heard in the news what is the country's current debt? No one speaks about it. We billions in debt and we are keep selling out all our natural resources. Secondly, I would like to, for election protection. We must have a standard day for election. No, I keep in the election in my back pocket. We need to done away with that. We need one day, either they choose our public holiday that already exists. I would re refer to Republic Day. We have election on that day. Public holiday, everyone goes and vote. It makes it more easier for everyone to get and it's not hidden. We know when it's coming up. My next contribution will be to sunset clause. There are too many laws on the book that politicians just seem to just overlook. And persons in the protective services know how to abuse these laws. We need to have sunset clause in all new laws coming out, uh, at least 50 to 75 years. They, they come to an end and they go, to go back to the governing bodies to be reviewed. Secondly, all people going up for any elected opposition must be held to the same level of a contractor. They must have be stated exactly, I am going to fix the road along the Shogunas main road, put it in writing. If it is not done, they get their pay cut. They get their pay take away. They get a standard salary of maybe 5,000, 6,000, the average minimum wage worker, and then after they get a, a, a little in investment, a little bonus for every, when they get our GDP out of debt. Secondly, I would like a full removal of placing power directly in the hands of the Prime Minister. We should move to a council state where each, each MP elects who gets to be the Minister of Finance, Minister of Education. But for my personal view, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Security, and the Minister of Security should come from the people who are professional in that state. The people who came from the medical field, let them elect the people who know about medical stuff. And the people who know about security, let, them, let the fire service, army, and police have their own counsel to say, okay, we present this person to be our representative. We need to move away from the one-man rule. The prime minister have all the power. The president have all the power. We need to move the way the people could get, in, get hold of the NPs and them. No one, they say true democracy is when the politicians fear the people. The people fear the politicians. Politicians could do anything and get away with it. We see it every day. It's very painful. 
Secondly, I would like to move to term limits. The term limits would be more back in the days when, when people was less educated, I could understand the need for why we needed our minister to be a senator and all these We need to done away with the Senate rules and all these county counts and all these things. All of this is inefficiencies. Wasting money to double back and look back. No, you go to your MP, he is the one organizing with the Minister of Works to get your area fixed up. Why? The same way they could go in Parliament, same way they could hold an MP. You all be the MP, I be the Minister. All you ask me, why am I not getting all your area done? Do that on a Monday, Friday, you go back to your, to your district and explain to them what is, why you didn't get your business fixed. Secondly, school reform. I would like to propose a system in which that, school that cameras be placed in schools to supervise what is the lesson being taught to children. Unlike most people in this room, I have a very wide base of knowledge of knowing what's going on on the outside world. Day. We have Trinidad is so special and sheltered from the horrors that have out there. We, it hasn't reached our shores as yet, but it's coming. And parents will be horrified when they start to learn some of the things that some teachers will teach their children. Secondly, a standardized syllabus, a public syllabus, where you could just go to the Ministry of Website, see this is what all standard five children should be learning, and whether you're in a school or home school, you just need to write that come. You want to, trans you want to go to a higher school, go from standard five, to form one, you just come and write the exam. You want to go from form one to university, you go and write the exam. You register, you write the exam. You want to go from university to some other degree, you don't even, it has so much options online, someone should just be able to just go and just write the exam. And that's it, it's not that hard. All it takes is just a simple registration. We have, this is the things we're looking for to be proficient in this field. And this is the problem that I keep seeing it. I am not a very, I got thrown out of school a few times. I'm not an intelligent person. Just and guiding you around your time. All right, well, and the next up is prison reform. I would like to see action taken when we could offer the prisoners some form of redemption. Whatever is your crime, once you are medically fit and able, Whatever you could contribute, whether it be an organ or blood, you will get your sentence reduced proportional to how life-saving your contribution is. Secondly, for, with the relevance with sports, I would like to propose two things. First, to reintroduce dueling laws. There's a, there's a certain aspect of being an adult where the ministry keeps saying, we're looking for people to represent us. But people have a natural desire for, to compete. And with dueling laws, you have a, a legal way where people could in, focus their energy in without just going out there and having random, that man hit me, we're going to shoot up your place or whatever. When you at least reintroduce the dueling law, it wouldn't, it's not a magic bullet, but it will help people focus their energy into becoming more fitter to, be, to challenge whoever they maybe have their disagreement with. Because some people could only express themselves through physical contact. We, we know this. And secondly, I would like to emphasize this point. We really, really need gun, gun control laws that does not affect the people. Right now, all the gun laws they to protect the upper class. Why you need a gun for? I want to protect my life, not a good enough reason. I could tell you that, apply for it, not a good enough reason. You have to have what you have to protect. I don't have nothing, but I want to protect my life. This, this is nonsense. And I said this before every time. All of you, I show sure have children. When the power goes out, and the place get dark, and you go home alone, no phone signal, no internet, no nothing. 
and you started to hear windows breaking. In that moment, in that quiet few seconds, where would you feel more safe? You protecting yourself and the ones you love, or you waiting for a next man to come with his gun to protect you? And that doesn't happen. I have served in, in the security industry. I was part of the CCP program. An incident happened right in Montrose, where a woman was bounced, knocked down, rolled up under the vehicle. The car was driven off. The license plate break off and fall on the ground. That happened at 2 p.m. Till 6, a, 6 p.m., we were still waiting for the police to arrive, right here from Shogunas. Not, not know ever come out of it, but tell the police to get somebody on the shoulder, definitely could do that. You flinch past the speed limit, definitely could do that. Can you wind up at this point, please? Yeah, well, I'll get into the most... Uh, and, yeah. My biggest problem currently, I have no children. The people in this room, some of them probably have children. And the part that hurt me to no end is that our leaders are treat the natural resources and the rightful heirs to this country like our old shoes. Bring to eight o'clock, so if, if ma'am, you may come forward by all means, yes. I'm just guiding that in terms of time, we'll be nearing the end pretty soon. So are there contributors after the lady that's at the microphone? One and two. Are there any more after that? And I saw two. The lady at the back, the gentleman at the back. And so you want to make an additional contribution after. So let's just do the three and then you can come forward. Right, okay. Good evening Hi. and welcome. Good night, everyone. Good night to the panel and good night, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kavita Jatan Singh right. and I'm from um, Kuva. Uh, most of the folks here would have already touched on a lot of the points I wanted to make. Uh, so I'll just pick up from the previous speaker. He was speaking around inefficiencies. So one of the inefficiencies that I see that affect our constitution and the people are how our boundaries are defined. So you have the boundary for the, constitu the constituencies being one thing, the boundaries for the municipal corporations being another. You have education using old county boundaries from you know, our colonial times. So I think we need to make that more consistent to ensure proper delivery of service. And the second point that I want to make is around, to me, I find the patriotism in this country is at an all-time low. So I'm proposing to make something like mandatory service to the country, whether it's through, you know, you have to spend two years in defense force when you come of age, something like that be included in our constitution. So that's my contribution. And thank you. Sir, you are next. By all means, come forward. Good evening, Good evening, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Romel Ragbir Singh. I live in Shabwanas. Um, I didn't come here to speak tonight. I just came to listen. But, you know, Benjamin Franklin said he was accredited with this saying, and it's, it's democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding on what to have for lunch. And the lamb is the people. And most of everybody here concerned with accountability. We have a serious problem with that in this country. From the, from the top, the civil service, everything. Um, letting someone else spend someone else's money is an is a impossibility to be prudent by another great man, Milton Friedman. And there must be measures in place to take these people, to give them, limit the amount of power that they have. L limit them to, because the more government there is, the less freedoms people have. And the government of the day needs to be limited. Smaller government. Right? That, is, that is, to me, one of the, is essential in a functioning society. And 
I agree with the gentleman here who said that the right to bear arms should be in the, in the Constitution because we have a crime rate that the police cannot deal with. The right to free speech to me is the bedrock of our function in society as well. I must be able to say what I want without any repercussions. Of course, there will be libel laws, and people have, people have to abide by that. But with all this censorship taking place from the COVID that went by, especially in the United States, they have freedom of speech, but they hired people in, in, in all the big tech companies to censor for them. So they, they, and they as well are protected by Section 230. So people, nobody cannot take those big tech companies to court. So I think that freedom of speech is, should be in the Constitution. There's so many things that I want to touch on. I don't think six months for this panel here to do a proper job on constitutional reform is not nearly enough. I, I think that this should be done in the, last, in the government's second term. It should be started at that time. And at least two and a half, three years to, to, to do a proper job on this. So I wish you all the best. But um, honestly, I don't see much coming out of it. I really don't. I hope I'm wrong. But I don't think a lot of people in Trinidad, this was not well advertised. I don't know what all your budget was, but it wasn't well advertised at all. Right? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Ragnarsson. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, the microphone is all yours. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, um, and good evening to the committee and to my fellow citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So I am Sasha Jatin Singh, and I'm from Kuva. Um, that was my sister who just spoke. And my, I guess my contribution or my recommendation for the revised constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is that we should include um, a right specific to the right to a safe, clean, healthy environment, um, specifically because, you know, within our constitution, you know, this is the highest and strongest law, as all the laws and, and regulations and policies must be consistent with this law. And our constitution has to protect human rights, and it sets forth the obligations of the state and also restricts government powers. But on a deeper level, um, constitutions reflect the most deeply held and cherished values of societies, right? And um, I think there's this, I, I don't know, I can't remember where this quote is from, um, but it's, it's that uh, a constitution is the mirror of a nation's soul. And I think that's very important because our constitution has to reflect what is important to us, what we, deeply value, what are our principles? And being a small island in the Caribbean, where we have, you know, we are disproportionately affected by climate change due to our, you know, unique vulnerabilities that exist as small island developing states, where, you know, we are impacted by hurricanes, flooding, heat waves, which we, you know, climate change is not something that's affecting future generations. It's happening right now. And I think everybody here in this region, in central region, could, you know, every year, as recent as last week, you know, my house was affected by flooding, right? We, we are feeling the effects of climate change, and it's not something that, that is affecting other people and other countries. It's happening here and now, and we have to have the highest law of the land reflect what is important to us and how are we going to act on something that is, it's an existential crisis. Because if it is that sea levels rise and the, the climate becomes too hot where it affects our food, our water, the quality of our water, um, our energy resilience, our economic and social development and prosperity, what, 
what, what does that leave for us? Where do we, like, do we even exist anymore? Because that is really and truly, that, that is an existential crisis for small islands, including Trinidad and Tobago. So my recommendation is that our revised constitution should include that all people of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago have a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, and noting that, you know, human rights and the environment are very much interdependent um, because, you know, the right to a sustainable environment is necessary for, you know, the full enjoyment of a wide range of human rights, such as, you know, the right to food, to water, to life, to safety as well. Um, and also, it should be noted that this right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment also would, should include substantive and procedural elements. And, you know, the substantive elements could include, you know, clean air, um, a safe and stable climate, access to safe water and adequate sanitation, healthy and sustainably produced food. So those are things that the citizens should be engaged in to decide what is important. What should this sustainable environment look like? Because as other um, distinguished speakers have stated, that we need to value our resources. And resources are not only people, but the resources are, what, are how our country and our people are able to sustain ourselves and have this economic prosperity and social development and social progress into the future. Um, so I think that is something that when we have that national dialogue, that should be up for discussion. What are those procedural and what are those substantive elements of this right to a clean and healthy environment? And um, it should be noted that this is not something new. The UN General Assembly has a resolution in 2022 on this right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And we also have other countries, other jurisdictions around the world that have actually incorporated it. Right here in the Caribbean, we have Belize, we have Jamaica, we have Aruba, and so forth. So Trinidad and Tobago could actually come and incorporate that in the Constitution and it actually sets us up for the future of what the future of Trinidad and Tobago will look like and can look like and how we all could participate in ensuring that we continue to be and to, to exist as an island. So thank you. Evening. Pleasant afternoon everyone. Citizen Stephen Sokram um, to the panel. Asking your assistance to help me refine this request. So going forward with amendments to the Constitution, whatever it might be, um, I am suggesting sectoral engagement or sectoral consultation as part of the process, similar to how it would include a certain color paper, then something has to be gazetted. I'm asking that you all could consider sectoral engagement when making amendments to, the to any part of the law. As a lecturer said, when lawyers make the law, who speak for the socially displaced on matters along those lines or that would avoid after amendments along criminal justice lines, only thereafter a certain association would come forward with their views. Right now we depend on independent senators to rep do research before the debate that may not be their field of expertise. So sectoral engagement as a requirement in the process would help represent this, the average citizen and we wouldn't have a piece of law passed in recent, in the last year. In the last year, um, to mitigate corruption. And very soon after, the law had to be reviewed. So, persons in the business and accounting sector may have been able to say, get it correct first. Thanks. 
this evening, and we're just on approaching quarter after the hour of eight. So all's well that is moving along well. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to facilitate our closing and vote of thanks. And according to the agenda this evening, both Ms. Jackie Samson Miguel and Ms. Hima Narain Singh are going to share their uh, contributions to close us off. So I hand over the microphones, please, on the, on the table to Ms. Samson Miguel and Mr. Narain Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Well, on behalf of this committee, I want to say thank you very much to the people of Shagonas and Environs for coming out this evening and sharing your concerns about constitutional reform. This effort is different to previous efforts in that what you have said to us will be the subject matter of a national dialogue in the form of a national conference on constitutional reform. So in response to those who are concerned that this effort might mirror those of the past, we are hopeful because this effort is being driven by you, the people. Okay, so I wanna say thank you for coming out. We have noted all that you have said. We are encouraged by your participation and we hope that you will continue to be as keen and interested in Trinidad and Tobago and in our constitution as you have revealed here this evening. I wanna thank the media, the moderator, the people of Shagornas, the persons who allowed us to use this wonderful venue, thank you very much, and I hope that each and every single one of you have a good night. Thank you. All right, Ms. Narayan Singh, on, your, on her behalf, everything has been the contribution from Ms. Samson Miguel. Ladies and gentlemen, we once again extend a word of thanks and appreciation to each of you for your contributions. Our responsibility, the committee's responsibility, is to receive your feedback, place it in writing from all across Trinidad and Tobago. That's the job, and it has been going successful thus far in receiving the contributions. Do have a safe rest of the evening, a safe journey home. May God continue to bless you, and God bless our nation. Good night.